that part. Uh, that extra gear, that first three steps. Huge strides in the performance. That I might not be the player I am today. All right, welcome to another episode of Behind the Gear. And today we're sitting with uh, Josh Kirkpatrick, who uh, is an Olympic athlete, um, has a really, really cool story and something that's maybe not, uh, doesn't involve a ton of hockey, which is something we've talked a lot about. So I thought it was really cool to bring you on. And and, uh, and obviously we have Mitch Stewart with us again, who's back from his summer of uh, in the dungeon. In the dungeon, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so in the summer training. Uh, but Josh has come on with us now and is helping out with... Um, with some of our uh, with some of our athletes, our pro athletes, yeah. and, and a lot of our guys, and working a lot, little bit more on focusing a little bit more on that kind of speed agility and that 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 kind of track work, which is uh, which is I think huge and something that we obviously need a lot of help with, and I think it's a big big piece of these young guys kind of getting better, right? Um, but Josh, kind of quickly to get started, you're from uh, kind of born and raised London, Ontario. Born and raised London, Ontario. It's uh, grew up went to Saunders. Loved okay. every second of it. Yeah. Uh, went away to university in Ithaca, New York at Cornell. Did track there. Found my way out west. So you're like you're kind of like like super smart. And stuff. Oh, uh, <laughs> track helped me get in. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, found my way out west after uh, after Cornell. Worked with the the Flames out there. Loved every second of it. And I know we'll get into that the story story after. But yeah, found my way back to London uh, a couple of years ago now. Bought a house. Got a. You know, just got married, did all oh, that fun stuff. No. So, so uh, you're all so grown up. I, I'm getting there. I'm trying to get there. I'm adulting now. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. Uh, but yeah, now now back here and and uh, super happy to be working with TPH and Mitch and yourself and and trying to get some athletes going here. Yeah, I know. For, well, yeah, we're obviously pumped to have you. It's been I, and the feedback from the guys have been awesome. So it's been. I think it's you know Mitch and I talked about this, and obviously you guys have talked a bunch, but. Uh, with the you know with the on ice staff we have and the off ice staff we have and the, the coaches that we have just having some guys that are have different expertise or different areas that they you know are are good at and kind of hand that off to them you know I think it's huge for the guys right yeah I mean that's been a and the girls sorry, kinda, and the girls the way that you know my vision has kind of been for TPH and the whole training atmosphere is to try to have people who have a I mean a fairly niche um, kind of expertise I guess you could say and with Josh's background he's done a ton of track work a ton of speed work. Um, and when you watch him do it, I mean, I can show someone how to do an A skip or a B skip or something like that, but it doesn't look the same when I do it as when <laughs> yeah. Josh does. You know, I might not butcher it, but, yeah. you know, when you see it, yeah. you, you know, oh, that's yeah. what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, I think that's a, that's, that's a huge piece of it. Like, uh, I know the first day we went over to the track, Josh was doing some bounds or some whatever, and everyone just kind of like, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> like, it was just Mitch, like, Mitch, how you don't do it like that? floating across <laughs> the track? And then... Uh, you know, and for these guys, that that's a you know, that's how they get better. I think they need to see it. Yeah, oh, and, I agree. Uh, you know, I think for Olympic weightlifting, they we've everyone does pretty well with it, and I think a big part of that is because I can demonstrate it reasonably yeah. well. And then you know, uh, the agility type stuff like pro agility and whatnot. Trev's done a ton of that in his day, and he does a great job of explaining it and demonstrating it. And uh, you know, having everyone with sort of those different pieces that they can bring to to help up the the players here is is huge. Yeah. And I, mean, I think, I, you know, you're, you're confident in what you're really, really good at and you're good at the other yeah. stuff too. And same with Josh, I'm sure you're super confident in your area and then really good at the other stuff too. But when you see a coach who's confident, let's say in the, in the track stuff and they're demonstrating it and they're, they're, it's like me on the ice, I'm confident in certain things. Oh, I'll demonstrate those really well. So other things, maybe I'll go half speed. Right. But yeah. at the same time, you're right. And I think it also for the, for the players, it gives them an instant respect, like, Whoa, okay. Wow. He can, you know, it, it just, like you said, it looks different than what other people have totally. been doing. Right. So it's, cool to kind of see that visual for sure mm -hmm. no i mean it's uh you know not you can't try to be selfish in this thing i don't want to try to do it all and i think that you know having people to bounce things off of like you just said josh he's also super strong does tons of weightlifting stuff um you know can definitely teach those things as well but i think that in what you've expressed to like the speed is the real passion part for him and for you know for all of us to be able to chat and throw things back and forth is that's yeah, huge. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't pretend to know everything about lifting. And yeah, I, yeah. and I think, I think a lot of, a lot of people out there might, uh, might try. I know what my strengths are and I know what my weaknesses are. And, uh, and definitely bouncing things off Mitch. Mitch has strengths that are far stronger than mine. And so coming here and learning from, from him, uh, and then even having the opportunity to teach him my side of things has been, I think that's been a great partnership so far in the last few yeah. months. And that's one thing I've always, you know, Mitch and I have known each other for a long time and obviously getting to know you, Josh, too. But um, 
there hasn't been, there's never an ego and it's always open conversation. It's never, I know more than you, you know more than I do on no matter what we're talking about. Right. And I, I, I appreciate and respect a lot of stuff that Mitch tells me or, you know, vice versa with you at the track and Mitch listens to what I have to say about the on ice, but that correlation I think is huge. And then building a team that everyone is, yeah, you're better than this. You're better at this than I am. That, that's okay. Right. And I think that's how you yeah. build anything, whether it's a family, a business, whatever it is, you, you, know, you got to have a little bit of give and take. And, you know, my wife's way better at so many things than I am. I'm not, I haven't really figured out what I'm good at yet, but, <laughs> you know, but, you know, you got that it's like yeah. a relationship, right? And I think having no egos and having guys, you know, and girls that are confident, but confident enough to be like, no, I, I'm, I want to take feedback on that as on the coaching side. And then at the end of the day, what's our main goal? To make athletes better, you know, and, and maybe we're a little bit specific to hockey or I am sometimes, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's making better athletes. And if everyone's on the same page and working together, then hopefully that's our result, right? Is those players are going to be better players. And I think that's a huge piece, you know? Um, so Josh, going back kind of when you're young, um, you know, what, uh, I know, I know that you kind of multi-sport and stuff like that, but I got, at what age did you even get into sport? Was it always kind of your parents were into it or older brother, older sister? Uh, well, my older sister uh, was a phenomenal baseball player. Okay. Uh, saw her. I think it's more or less my parents were trying to get rid of me for, <laughs> yeah, for a long time. Busy. Exactly. <laughs> keep me out of trouble. Uh, but yeah, real early, I was playing football uh, when I was super young, uh, elementary school age. So I started there and just ended up falling in love with the team dynamic of things and the people that I met. And Fortunately enough, as I grew up, I grew up around these people. We all went to the same high school. So it was a, it was a great springboard into different sports. Yeah. So volleyball in, in, in uh, high school, basketball, uh, track and field, obviously. Uh, just kind of got my feet wet in a, in a bunch of things. And, and Mitch and I have, have discussed this, I think, at length, uh, especially in our first meeting, that I'm, you know, I, I think I have a different perspective than a lot of people because I, I never played hockey competitively. Uh, we couldn't afford it, and that was that was sort of the the base point of it. And so I got into other sports, and I fell in love with being a complete athlete, being able to pick yeah. up a football or a basketball or or a tennis racket or anything, and being able to compete in it. And, yeah. and growing up, I think that was a huge catalyst into you know my how far my athletic career went. Uh, I'm certainly not the most gifted athlete, but I work my I work yeah. my butt off, and and I'm a you know I like to think that I'm a technician, and and I attribute a lot of the sports that I played growing up to build, to build that athlete. Yeah. Right. And I think it's huge. Like we talk about it a bunch, but I think it's, it's huge to have multi, you know, multi-sport athletes. I think that's, I think that's a really, really big piece and something we are lacking a, a little bit. And I, I think the kids in general just aren't as active as maybe we were just going to the baseball field and playing ball with your buddies or basketball or ball hockey or whatever it is, you know? Um, one thing you said too about hockey being expensive. I don't, I, I totally agree. And I think, you know, your registration fees are one thing, but on top of that, you've got your fees for just equipment, which is, you know, can be crazy depending on what you want to spend. It can be affordable, but it definitely can be crazy. Yeah. And the other thing, unfortunately, is we got to play on a frozen sheet, which costs a lot of money and that <laughs> makes everything more expensive. Whereas you can get a pair of cleats and a ball and go play soccer on the, you know, anywhere. Right. Or, uh, you know, there's fields all over the place, which, which make that way more accessible for, for, uh, for any, any athlete. Right. Um, so you started in football and then kind of gravitated, you know, I guess through high school, you were one of those guys probably running for athlete of the year every year. Probably, from I, a bunch I, yeah, of I was trying to. The, yeah, uh, we we had a lot of good athletes at Saunders actually. Uh, you know, a couple of guys went pro volleyball. Uh, a lot of guys got scholarships to the states. It was, you know, I lucked out with the year that I was there, and uh, in the year you know prior to me. Yeah, that's cool. The the athletes were great, and so we we never really strayed away from being athletes. You know, we were students. Yeah some of the times, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but most of it was had to. Yeah, exactly because we had to, we were yeah. there. Uh, yeah. But yeah, a, a lot of the guys that were around us, we, we built that little core group and, and yeah. grew up together and, and did that. So it was, it was great. It was a great and learning all those, experience. And uh, all those other guys played a bunch, like played all the sports with you kind of like you guys were all kind of that core. In that core group between that, volleyball, yeah. basketball, cool. track, you know, everything was, uh, we flipped back and forth. It yeah. was, it was great. And did you guys dominate in London a little bit when you guys were going through it? My one claim to fame, we, uh, volleyball, we, we went four straight years winning offset, which is, wow. I don't think it's ever been done since. So it was, yeah, yeah, it was fun. We had some studs. I wasn't one of them. I can say I was <laughs> part of the team, uh, but we had some studs and some great coaches, which I've also been really lucky with and yeah. I've only had positive coaches my whole life so uh which I think is why I translate back into trying to be a positive coach yeah. and uh and trying to help kids yeah. growing up 
Oh, that's cool, man. And Mitch, what uh, what sports were you into when you were young? Like, what uh, what kind of sports did you kind of gravitate to as a youngster? Hockey was the first one, for yeah. sure. I mean, my dad had me on my skates really young, and uh, I played hockey all the way up until the end of high school. Okay. And then through high school, I was playing soccer, and I was doing track stuff. Yeah. Um, those were kind of the sports throughout the year. And then, honestly, it was pretty young. Like, it was in grade, grade 8 was the first time I started going to the gym just on my own doing stupid stuff oh man you think back, <laughs> like, you think back like, i can't believe they let right kids in great they, in london they don't in ingersoll they do like <laughs> let them into the gym just on their own yeah. just playing around that's stuff. why you're shredded now <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then uh and it grade 10 is when i started kind of trying to like where i started migrating more towards the performance side of things i was never too into like the bodybuilding side but i did start falling in love with the the training aspect almost more than the sport and that's yeah. when i started getting into the track stuff as well because it was kind of like training, yeah. like more just regular training opposed to hockey and soccer, which, uh, I mean, I like that stuff too, but it's, it's different. Yeah. Oh, well, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's more in that now you're entering more of an individual sport, right. With kind of track, you know, you're depending on what's, what, uh, what event you're in, but, and, and just like weightlifting, same thing. Cause you, you got into a little bit of com- like competing a bit at the, with the Olympic lifting and stuff yeah, like so that. Yeah. So the main, and the main reason I did that, to be honest. So initially I was going to the gym. I was doing your bench press, your squats, all that kind of stuff. You see, it's almost like a bodybuilding type program, even though that wasn't my, my interest was more on the performance side. Um, and then when I started learning about more about what it takes to, you know, be an athlete and performance, I learned about Olympic weightlifting and I hired an Olympic weightlifting coach more or less to learn how to do the lifts properly. Right. Cause I knew I wanted to get into strength and conditioning. And then when I started to realize how much there was to it, I was like, I don't want to go and start trying to teach this to people without really experiencing myself. So I kind of dove in for, I'd say it was about three, four years where I was exclusively training for that and started to compete. Um, and I competed up to provincial level did, um, I hit the standards for a national level, never competed at nationals and then kind of more or less shut it down after that. I still do the Olympic lifts, but I <laughs> yeah, don't yeah. compete anymore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so my, oh, my cool. story, there's a little bit different where I, I really did get into it to be honest, more of a, more, like almost I an education, it was a, right? it was, I knew it was a big piece of, yeah. you know, how I wanted to train the players that I was going to, you know, that I wanted to train. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool, man. It was really cool. Um, now, we, talk, we talked a lot with, with, with young players that ended up getting scholarships or getting talked to by schools about, you know, going to going to wherever for, for hockey. But uh, as, a, as a track athlete, how that, how that journey happened? So through high school, obviously at some of the bigger meets and, and you know, offset things like that, I'm just going to assume there are scouts there. Or there are people that are bird dogging for these universities and talking to young athletes, right? So how that whole process happened for you as far as, you know, and, and were there a bunch of schools kind of in the mix or was it simply just Cornell that had talked to you? Uh, you'll find out through this podcast, a lot of the stuff in my life has, has kind of been luck. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know what I did. Maybe it's a good clean living from a young age, but a lot of, a lot of things have just kind of fallen in my lap. So, uh, Cornell was the only one I was, I was convinced that I was going to go to a uh, university in Canada, which I had no yeah. issue with. There's a lot of really good programs here Yeah, and a lot of really good athletes have come out of Canadian universities. Uh, but it was always in the back of my head to try to get down to the States. And one day they contacted, uh, Keith Hurd, who was my yeah. coach, uh, back then and teacher at Saunders and still actually currently my coach, sent him a letter and he said, maybe you'd be interested in this. And so I kind of chewed it off. I didn't even, I honestly didn't even know what Cornell was. I was going to say, <laughs> why? Like, yeah, yeah, I, there's like 10,000 universities in, in yeah, the States. Like what? Exactly. Yeah. It wasn't like LSU or Ohio State yeah, or like yeah. the big ones, Michigan. Yeah. Um, I was like, ah, Cornell, I don't even. And so I did some research and all of a sudden I was like, oh, this, this could I'm be, legit, this, this, could, this could be fun. Yeah. Um, so went back and forth with the coach. He ended up uh, coming to my house in, in London. And I told him straight up, I was like, you're, you're the only coach who's interested in me. Uh, so, so, you know, the ball's in your court. If you can get me in great, uh, I'd I'd love to go there. And he was phenomenal. He's, he's still, uh, one of the best coaches I've ever had. Very, very caring. And and he helped me get into, uh, plug him. What's what's his name? Nathan Taylor. He's he's no longer the coach there. Yeah. Um, but he's, he's coached, uh, Olympic teams. He's, he's cool. phenomenal. He's a brilliant mind and a very caring person. And he helped me literally get in and get out. Yeah. Um, there were some times there where school was tough and balance and both were difficult, but yeah. yeah, Cornell was the, the only one who was really interested in me. Um, so for anybody out there who's thinking about scholarships, they literally, they happen, you keep working hard and, and people will find you yeah. if, if it's worth it, people will find you. 
Yeah. And it's funny, even in, it's the same, I think, with any sport, you know, we so always say, like, don't worry so much about where you're playing or what level you're playing at. If you're good enough, they're going to find you, right? And exactly, it's the same yeah. thing. And I think one thing you said earlier about that hard work, that's one thing that I don't think can be taught, number one. I think it can kind of be pushed a little bit sometimes, but you got to really want it inside. And for you, obviously, you know, growing up as a hockey player, I think we all want to play in the NHL. You know, you're all dreaming of playing road hockey and you're holding the Stanley Cup. <laughs> so for you, as a kind of a track athlete in, in, in high school, did you have any – dreams of you know one day being on the podium or one day kind of you know what what was that kind of end goal for you with 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 your sport and basically track well I, I i started just working hard and loving it and so i was i was a pole vaulter so not a lot of people do pole vault in canada <laughs> uh i tried to pick the the sport with the least amount of competition so Smart. i could try to stand <laughs> <Smart>. out <laughs> um but yeah i started in pole vault and, I, and really just started because i i loved it uh, and then I started to become a little bit better at it and, it, and I started to gain an appreciation for what the sport was as a whole. Started doing long jump, try, or four by one sprints, all that fun stuff. So uh, once I started getting better, I started sort of having that dream to go to the Olympics. And especially when Cornell uh, approached me to go there, it's like, okay, this is the next step. Yeah. And, and in my head, I'm always thinking steps towards an end goal. I think it was about the my junior year there uh, when I started to become a decathlete. I had an idea that I wasn't, you know, I don't, I didn't think I was good enough, and that might have been a bad mindset, but um, I don't regret thinking thinking like yeah. that. Yeah, and like how, like, sorry to pause you, but how crazy good were the athletes you're competing against though? Like when you're looking at some of these athletes that are competing at, from other schools when you're at meets, like was it off the charts or was everyone kind of pretty? It was the big meets were off the charts, like the yeah. uh, pen relays. When uh, you know, I, I remember sprinting against a guy from LSU, and I looked over and I was like, "Man, I'm gonna get annihilated <laughs> here." So you're feeling confident? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm in the blocks, and it was the first time I looked over. I was like, yeah, "That guy, that guy's just gonna beat me. <laughs> like it, this isn't even gonna be close." And I, and you know, I never, I never gave into the competition, uh, but there was points. I mean, you look at other guys, and yeah. you just, you know, that they're better than you. Um, so yeah, there was, there was a lot of really good athletes, uh, population alone, they're going to have, yeah, they're going to have really good sure. athletes. So there was some big meets where it was, it was a little intimidating, but that was also a huge thing for my growth seeing that. Uh, so eventually when I, I made one national team in, in track and the way track works, you kind of hit standards and then you get chosen for separate, uh, okay. big national teams, depending on which meets are, are that summer. And so when I got that. It was uh, it was sort of sort of the pinnacle of my career at that point, but it was also unfortunate that it, I went and I was like, oh man, that I don't think the Olympics are going to happen. Let's get this education right. and 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 kind of get out of here. Uh, and I was completely content with that. And what uh, what event was it? Was it pole vault? It was pole vault. Okay. Yeah. So you went to the nationals and like. Like how'd you finish in the nationals, or like how how that whole how that whole event or whole process go? So I was uh, I won junior nationals when I was young, which was uh, which was fun, uh, and then I would be pretty consistent, sort of top three, top four at senior nationals, and then and then when I went and made a national team, uh, it was the francophone game, so it's like the opposite end of the Commonwealth Games, and a little less competition, but still fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that alone was a big eye opener to say that there is a lot. There are a lot better track athletes out there than I was, so <laughs> so it was uh, it was fun. It was an awesome experience. I I think I got as far as I could have got yeah. in track, and I got as much out of it yeah. that I could have got. So yeah, uh, so yeah, I thought I thought my athletic career was done at that point. Yeah, well, no, yeah, for, especially it's kind of it's almost it's one of those things where you uh, when you end up meeting up like as you move up levels, right? You go from high school, you're the big dog in high school, you and your boys, and then. You go to, you know, the junior nationals, you win, and I'm pretty legit. Well, obviously, we're talking about Canada, too, <laughs> yeah. where you have, like, no track and field at all for, for like, six, seven months because yeah. everything's frozen. <laughs> all indoor, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And there's not a lot of good indoor tracks or stuff to work on, really. Like, I mean, even in London, you got, what, Thompson Arena is probably one of the only indoor tracks, Indoor right? tracks, yeah. Um, So, you know, and then, but then to have that realization as, as you know, and as you move out of that, your bubble and that bubble gets bigger and bigger. You're like, man, there's so many good athletes and so many good, you know, in all different, different disciplines. Right. But it, it's almost a bit of a reality check. I think when you get to that point, sometimes for hockey players, it doesn't matter what the athlete is, but as you get to that higher level, you're like, man, but you found a way to figure it out. Like you changed your sport from pole vault to dick, which is r ridiculous yeah, gonna, like, to me. What was that transition? Yeah. Like, like in high school, were you just doing pole vault? Like, and then you started learning all these other events, like, 
in university or how, like how did that play out uh I, again i i i tried to be a complete athlete so i i loved pole vault but there are a lot of facets of pole vault that you need to be so sure. you need to be fast you need to be pop you need to be all that kind of stuff so uh so naturally i was you know i was a faster guy uh long jump was awesome i did hurdles growing up too so i had i so got my feet wet in yeah that. in a bunch of different be- events I feel like that would be a pretty tough one to pick up without especially much. Especially when you're short. Yeah, you know, like, that's, <laughs> like watching people run those early. It's crazy. Oh yeah, like, yeah. it's kind of oh. it's kind of fun. I've bailed I a couple imagine. times. Yeah. It, it, I wish there was video on that. Yeah. <laughs> so, like to me, like as I mean, as, I I obviously like challenges, but someone's gonna go. Okay, we're gonna we're just gonna train one event where you stick a pole in this thing, you go flying over top of the thing. <laughs> yeah. But instead of that, this, this year we're gonna train for ten events. Yeah. That sounds like a great idea, man. Sign me up. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, and, and it, it ended up being good. It, it definitely is intimidating. For sure. Uh, at the, you know, at the end of the second day after running the 1500, like, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, oh, I'm not man. built for yeah. a long distance. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and people who see this video can see that I'm not built for a long <laughs> distance. Um, so it, it was definitely intimidating. But again, I, I've taken that sort of idea in my life that whatever is asked of me, I'll I'll do. Yeah. And so, you know, that junior year when the coach asked me to start being a decathlete, which was fun, but it was the other team events that it was like, okay, you're doing the decathlon, but then you're doing four other individual events because they score them uh, in your conference for these big team championships. Oh, okay. So you'd end up doing 14 or 15 events in oh, a wow. in a weekend or over wow. a four day period. Uh, but again, he asked me to do it, so so I. Did it? Yeah, I'm. I'm not going to shy away from a challenge. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was certainly the best shape of my life. Well, I was going to say, like, we're all sitting here talking, and I mean, aside from Mitch and while you, and I guess I'm talking for myself here, but no, but I mean, <laughs> if I'm 40, I'm sitting here like I'm just thinking I had 10 like match, but you're already in good shape. You're a track athlete. You've been training all summer. Like, you know, you're not taking much time off. You're 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 in it. So yeah. as far as the body is adapting, it's not too too bad. But um, going through 10 events or 14 events on a weekend or four days, like. That's that's tough on the body, let alone trying to do well at all those yeah. at all those events, right? Because yeah. you can mail it in on a couple, which you I mean you can't I could, but you can't do that as far as you're you're, you're competing, and some of these events are for team points, so you're going basically balls out on every event, trying to you know score the best that you can. Yeah, I mean, what's that even like mentally? Just wrapping your head around you just go one event, throw it away, second event, throw it away. And yeah, kind of it was a, it was actually huge for my athletic development was was that mental challenge more than anything a, a lot of guys can do 10 events yeah they can they can get through it they can grind Physically, through it they can, right? exactly yeah. yeah um but nine times out of ten you're not going to have a good event each time and so you learn very quickly that what's done is done and you need to reset your focus and continue pushing forward yeah and uh and i didn't really know that when i was just doing one event you know you, you do one event you dwell on how good or bad you yeah. did and it just yeah. kind of simmers in you and it and it eats you away or you're on this this high that uh that doesn't go away but in the deck you realize that it's like okay this is this is the event that i'm doing right now here's where my focus is next event okay here's where my focus is now regardless of what just happened yeah um and you know guys okay. like uh from london like damian warner yeah they, right. they, they that guy's a freak of an athlete yeah. he's uh i remember coming back i think i've only done one deck against him um when he was just starting and he was already like he's ridiculous really he's eh? one of the best athletes i've ever seen in my life and you see the success that's coming and i'm sure he's uh he's had some i'm sure he's had some struggles in the event but his mental strength is is second to none um, and you learn that in, in, in the deck and I only did it for two years. So yeah. I, I, you know, I'm not an experienced decathlete, but, um, but it's really cool learning, learning how to manage yourself over such a grind. Yeah. Yeah. You learn a lot about yourself. It's oh, pretty for fun. Sure. Yeah. Now, uh, did they like at, at Cornell I and mean, maybe in high school, I'm not sure, but did they ever, did you guys ever do any sports psychology or things like that? Cause sports psychology is something that I think is a big, big part of sport is a little bit of taboo back in the day where all oh, you're seeing a shrink or all oh, you need the sports psych. Uh, nowadays, I mean, most athletes have, especially individual athletes, like you look at golfers or even track athletes mm-hmm. or tennis players, they've got someone that they're working with. Hockey players are doing it a lot now too. Yeah. Was there anything like that at Cornell? Or did you guys get any kind of help or guidance that way or just your coach? Not at, uh, not at Cornell. It was, I wish, you know, looking back on it, I wish we did. Yeah. I've got, I've got nothing against it. The, this Olympic year in bobsled though, uh, our pilot, Nick Polinato had, a like a mental coach or yeah. it was like a, a sports psych that helped him out and 
in the first two years of of this sort of quad, this Olympic quad, he didn't have one, and then the last two years he did. And the the change in his mentality was incredible. Really? And when we were on his team, we had access to his to, to this guy, and he was in, like he was insane. He would convince you that you could take over the world, yeah. and you just <laughs> and you just realize how good these people are. Um, at not only building you up, but getting, giving you the mental strength to get through, yeah. you know, the hard times. Cause that's no one, you don't really need a, a guy to pump you up when you're already on a high. You right. need these guys to, yeah. to help you out when you're going yeah. through, going through a struggle. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I was really lucky to be a part of just a, you know, a handful of sessions with him, but some of the things that he would say, you know, we'd go into every competition, just reminding ourselves of that. Uh, one really cool thing he said was replace the picture. And this goes along with any, with any sport that, that is listening right now or any sport that people are doing. And uh, when you're, the way it was explained to us is when you go through a difficult time, and in, in this case it was bobsled, you know, you, you crash around a corner. And so all of a sudden he's thinking this corner, we're going to crash. Um, and he, he made a very conscious effort of teaching us to go into it, replacing that picture. So if you're thinking about that, like get that in the garbage. Yeah. You really need to focus on positive things. So don't think about what happened. Again, going back to, you know, the deck, don't think about the event before. Replace that picture with a <clears> positive <throat> side of sport or the positive side of what you're doing right now. And he he went into a lot more depth of that, but that was literally, that was a mantra that we carried for a lot of That's the cool. Olympics. Yeah, so I, I love it. I wish yeah. we had it. I think, I, I think it would have helped or will help a lot of athletes in the future. Yeah, and I think we talk about this a lot in our sport as far as the team sport, but we don't teach kids a lot of times how to be a leader, right? We don't teach them how to lead other 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 people. We also don't teach kids how to fight through pain. And I don't mean like a broken arm or a, or a, bro, or a twisted ankle. I mean, you know, hitting that max. Yeah. You know what? For instance, we had a couple of kids doing that. I gave it to them. You know, they did the beat test. They pulled a six. I, I lost it. <laughs> I was like, you almost have to try to get- hard to not do well to pull a six off. Like. I was Did losing. you see the score? You saw no, the score? I heard about it. So I, I oh, talked okay. to them today because I was so upset that to me, the beep test or like the, the, these are there all were men- people that walked off. Like, well, these are, these are to me, those are uh, times in your life, which we, I did the beep test as a kid. I'm sure you guys did. It sucks. No one likes the beep test, but I know when every time I did it, I tried to go as hard as I could and try to go as far. I wanted to beat everybody out there. Right. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I did. Sometimes I didn't. Didn't matter. But to me, those are all mental like mental moments that these young athletes can get stronger with. Right. And know how you can, like, I don't think a lot of our kids nowadays know how to push themselves to that. I'm not saying like Paso die, you know, or anything like that, but I've just mean like push yourself. Cause as soon as they feel pain, yeah. then a little bit more pain, yeah. they're done. The they're thing with done. the beat test, it's interesting too. It, I find it starts so easy that like, it's easy, it's easy, it's easy. And then all of a sudden it just starts to be like a little bit crappy. And then they're like, yeah, I'm done. Like, whereas it, sure. you know, like, yeah. you're just starting at that yeah. point. Like they start, they really stop when they're just starting. Like that's, that's, that's the, when you're starting. Yeah. And that's the point of like, <laughs> and that's oh, like six. little, it's like <laughs> like, little discomfort. Yeah. You know? that's too good. And I mean, you've been in situations, I guarantee where you're like a lot of discomfort and I don't mean injuries. I just mean you're gassed, you know, you're breathing heavy. You're, you're, you're gasping for that last, like 1500 is a cup, like 400. I hate not not that I ever ran competitively, but like I ran it in high school and stuff. Like worse, right? You're sprinting for 400 meters, it's, but 1500 is like a good clip for a long race, and that's like like yeah, how do you sucks. feel at the end of that? Yeah, I mean, there's I, there's a picture ridiculous. I gotta dig up somewhere. It looked like Jesus on the ground after like I was passed oh. out. That was the one event where I, you know, if I was leading or or even close, the the coach would I'd have a coach at each corner telling yeah. me how far I could be behind these people because it's a point event. So it's like. <laughs> Okay, just stay within this right. distance, and I'm just gas. But you're right. I think it's. But I think it's uh, with a lot of athletes growing up, they hit these hard hard times because they grow up being elite, an elite athlete in their sport, and so they, it's been it's been easy for them for a long time yeah. because they've been the best athlete that in on their respective teams, and then they hit some hardship uh, when they get to a more elite sport, and it's you either kind of shit or get off the pot. Yeah. You, you're either going to give up and, and shy away from the competitiveness. Or like you said, that's when the leaders start coming out and you start saying, well, yeah, uh, right now I'm as good as everybody else. And I've been better than everybody else in the, in the previous teams. Now I'm going to try to do the same thing just on a more elite level. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. And that it's true. Like with what you were talking about when you were younger, I'm sure maybe the first time you picked up a tennis racket, for example, you're not, maybe not good at it. 
but then you stick with it. Whereas a lot of these kids will pick up a, a new thing, whatever, basketball, whatever, and then they're great at hockey, but then they'll just shut it down. So even just the mental aspect of trying something new and sucking at it for even one, two, three, four, five times, but then coming back to it and doing it again, I think they, there's a lot to learn from Huge. that. Like not playing competitive necessarily in those other sports, but just sucking at something once in a while. Like I think yeah. it's important to suck oh, at yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like I, I still try to do things that I – I suck at. Well, you're you good know? at doing stuff like, you suck yeah. at. <laughs> I, 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 I like to try to do no, that. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's like even like you took up your uh, gymnastics or doing different yeah, things like I that. I think terrible. I'm still terrible. But no, like, but I think it's it I is learned, cool. I've learned a lot. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. Like the reason I did that was from an injury, and then I was like scared of a lot of stuff to be honest. And then I was like, okay, I got to do something to get my confidence back. <laughs> That's literally why I did it. And then I was like, I'm going to learn how to do a backflip or something. So I went to gymnastics and started learning how to do it. And then it exposed a ton of other weaknesses and it brought, it, you know, I, I built myself up a lot from doing that stuff, getting yeah. more flexible and whatever. But it was, it all started with doing something that I was, you know, that I sucked at. Yeah. And I think the more you can do that, especially when you're, you know, in those younger years, like, you know, by the time you hit, let's say, the highest level, if that's the first time that you're getting, you're sucking, <laughs> right? that's not good. Yeah. Or even like if that's the first time you ever had to, to go that hard. That's what I mean. Yeah. Compete like, that hard. You know, and then I think, I think you got, I think then you're at, you're basically whoever's been helping you along the way has done a disservice, right? To not, and I, I'm not, I'm not talking old school coaching and, you know, yelling and screaming at guys to go harder. I mean, just, just being able to push kids a little bit to that threshold of them, you know, feeling uncomfortable. There was a saying, I was at the U17s this summer with Hockey Canada, and they kept saying, uh, try to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And it could apply to it a lot of different things, but whether you're running and you start feeling uncomfortable, get comfortable at that state. You know, get comfortable at that uncomfortable state. And then even going into situations where uh, I'm, you know, I've never done, really never done yoga. And in my mind right now, I'm like, I wouldn't mind trying to do yoga because I'm getting older and I wouldn't mind getting a little more flexible and just try it out. Right. But it's one of those things where I feel, I would feel so uncomfortable going into a yoga yeah. class right now because I'd be terrible at it. I have no idea what I'm doing for probably a good four or five, 10 sessions. Right. But I need to get comfortable being in those uncomfortable situations. And that's going to yeah. help me grow as a person probably and experience different things kind of like you've done, you know? Yeah. It's funny when you say that, because I know the first time that I walked into this gymnastics gym, I was like. I know what it feels like now for like a person who doesn't go to the gym to walk into the gym. Cause like yeah. I, there's all this, like just mats everywhere. Yeah. Like I don't know how to use yeah. anything here. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah, it's exactly that. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. I stood, first I just started asking questions to people that were there. Like, hey, cause it's just like an open adult yeah. gym, like gym. Like, so I'm just going, Did hey, what are you working on today? When you walked in, like, was everyone just like, <laughs> it's like right, this guy. That's, what yeah. I, that's what I feel like. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Whether that's true or yeah. not. Something Josh said earlier too that I and it's it's related. He was talking about focus and just being able to switch your focus off and on. And this is something I've been talking to the kids a lot more about. But it's all about hard work. That you know they're talking about hard work, and hard work is a lot more than just like going hard on the bike or doing a hard sprint or whatever. Like to me, it's hard work to to you know do your mobility stuff because it's something you don't want to do. Yeah. And I think shifting your focus in those different things, like I find that some some of these kids are really good at being intense but they're not good at like scaling it back and bringing their focus to other things That's like point, yeah. the minor yeah. details. So like learning to focus on, yeah, when you're playing a game, like you got to have a different focal point than when you're in practice. And when you're in the gym doing, you know, weightlifting stuff, your focus needs to be a little bit different than when you're, you know, working on your rotator cuff or whatever yeah. it is. Um, you know, when you're stepping up to try to do a heavy clean, you're not being dainty about it and thinking about all the little details and all the little muscles and whatever. Whereas, you know, you're, you got to kind of fire yourself up a little bit when well, you're doing other stuff, whether it's your warm up exercises or, you know, prehab type stuff, your focus needs to be different. When you're stretching, your focus needs to be different. I think learning to shift those gears to, you know, focus on different elements of your, of your, uh, you know, your performance or your development is, is huge. Yeah. And I, a lot of them don't, that's something that you can develop really young, I think. And, um, they don't, it's just, they're either on or yeah. off or, Tell, yeah. tell them to be an athlete at 30. You start focusing, <laughs> focusing yeah, on yeah. the little yeah, things. Yeah, you have to. Because yeah. you get By beat up point, real you're, quick. You're forced. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think that's that's something that I think Mitch and myself, and, and I'm sure you do too, we're older and we're still doing this. Yeah. And and I think this is this is important for, the, for younger kids to see because we have a different, you know, when I was a track athlete and then when I was a bobsled athlete, I was two different athletes at those points i learned a lot from my my failures in track yeah 
to become a better athlete in bobsled. I, I focused on the little things and I'll be honest, like, I wasn't, I didn't really care about stretching or doing any yeah. of that kind of stuff in, in college. Cause I was young and I could get away with it. Yeah. But now doing it, I think about how much better of an athlete I could have been yeah, right. doing all the little things. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I truly believe that. <laughs> I do. I, yeah. I, I, I <laughs> yeah. actually do truly believe yeah, that because no, I would have really been, though. I yeah. would have been out. I would, I wouldn't have made it through four years if I didn't focus on yeah. the little thing. Everybody can lift a weight. Everybody can be strong. Everybody can come in and check in for a shift at the gym. But you see the best athletes in the world, they they don't really check out. They they check their focus in different sure. ways, but the, it's a lifestyle to them. Yeah. No, that's so true, man. And, you know, going back to the flexibility thing, which you mentioned mobility and stuff is boring. Like the stretching is, is, let's be honest, like especially for young kids, like yeah. SF, right? And I remember growing up, my mom was my mom was pretty active growing up. So was my dad, but my mom more so. And uh, I remember her at young ages. I didn't start playing hockey till I was nine, so I was a bit late to it and whatever. But my mom would always be like randomly like, oh, we got to stretch. And, and she, we'd stretch sometimes. And I was really flexible growing up. And I still am flexible. flexible. Yeah. yeah. But I, but man, it's amazing how much tighter I am now than what I was like at 25. You know what I mean? But it comes back really quickly. So if you do work at it and for me getting out of bed in the morning, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm fortunate so far. I, I'm not like, you know, not yet. I will <laughs> yeah. be for sure. But, <laughs> but I think, I think a lot of that has to do with, uh, I try to stay in shape. I try to run. I try to work out. I try to like stay, you know, flat, work on mobility and stuff like that. And I think, I think it's important just as, just like you said, like a lifestyle thing. And the players that are elite and the best of the best, they're focusing on those. We call it, call them details, right? But those little details are their game. Those little details are their sport where it's flexibility, it's nutrition, it's sleeping properly. It's picking your spots. You're going to drink like all those little things I think are huge. And when you look at some of these elite athletes, you have your odd freak that's going to be a booze bag, party animal, and just unbelievably good. Mm -hmm. But then most of them it's are not the norm. No, no, most of them are going to be the ones that are just they're, they have their routine. They have their you know not to say they don't like to party and have fun or do you know do other sports, whatever. That's fine. But for the most part, they've they've got a bit of an agenda, a little bit of an itinerary laid out on how they do things day to day or week to week. You know, and it's, and they got to find that on their on their own, right? And it comes back to us saying you find out what you suck at, what what works for you, what doesn't work for you. I was watching a, actually a video on Twitter. It was going around the other day, um, and it was from a, a guy who created a company. He's, I think he's got something like 900 employees now. Like It's a very successful company. And he came on, he said, I couldn't be an entry-level employee at my own company because I wouldn't be able to pass the math test that <laughs> right. it takes to, to yeah. do this, but I can run my company. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he's like, I grew up, you know, I was terrible in school, I was, but I, I tried hard and I did all that kind of stuff. And, and and it was it was a five minute video, but it actually struck because he he came on and he was very boisterous about this. He said, "Just try shit." Yeah, and that's that was his that was his little like motto was that's just good, try yeah. shit. 100%. And and uh, and he's like, I tried and failed at a lot of things, but I found out what I did by doing the work and grinding and and just putting myself out there. If I sucked, I sucked. But I finally found something that worked for me, yeah. and I think I think athletes all across the board need to find out what works for them because it it you can't just get to the to the highest level being mediocre at at the small details unless yeah. like you said unless you're a freak but 99 percent of the population yeah. isn't they yeah. aren't freaks they they work hard and they find what works for them yeah no if, uh, yeah I think that's a great point I like that I like that just try shit it's good <laughs> it's good nice and simple I, I think, think I can remember yeah, that exactly yeah <laughs> yeah. Um, so finishing up at, at Cornell, you kind of, you're done, you're, you're kind of, and I guess for you, maybe that Olympic dream, maybe fizzled it out a little bit as far as just, you know, I'm probably not going to make the Olympics as a track athlete and kind of come to grips with graduating, getting a degree, which is amazing. And then going on to, to finding a job. So how did you, how was that transition coming out of college and then going into kind of the real world? Like, did you take some time? Did you travel? Did you kind of have an idea what you wanted to do as far as work? Or You can say what I did was travel. I, <laughs> I, uh, one of my buddies, actually from London as well, Adam Seabrook, phenomenal athlete, one of the smartest people I, I know, he offered uh, his couch in Santa Monica uh, for me to come down and try to look for jobs in the States. And I kind of used that as an opportunity to just live in Santa Monica yeah. rather than really <laughs> for, look for, for jobs. jobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but but that's what I did right after, and and we you know I was floating back and forth, but no one really wants to hire a Canadian in the states. It costs a lot of money, yeah. um, so did that for a year. Got pretty fat, pretty out of shape, <laughs> but uh, it was one of those things where I, I enjoyed the lifestyle. I, I was an athlete all my life, and I oh, just yeah. kind of wanted to let yeah. loose a little bit. So what did your lifestyle consist of? Like, so <laughs> you coached at McDonald's and bench press basically, <laughs> but you'd never be able to <laughs> recognize it. We actually we lived. 
Uh, if anybody's ever been to Santa Monica, we lived right above the Third Street Promenade, like right on the near the pier. Oh wow! Uh, in the basement was a McDonald's, and so yeah, we were we weren't the best influences on each other. Yeah, uh, but we made it. Yeah, we made it. That's good. Yeah, but then I end up running out of money. Right, <laughs> that always happens. Came right, back, came back home to mom. Yeah, uh, and then two weeks later, I was like, I can't, I can't stay here. I need to do something. So yeah. I just packed the truck and went out west with a women of prayer. Oh yeah, really? Eh? Yeah. And yeah. uh, to Calgary, is that where you kind of were yeah. gonna, is that where you were planning on going? Uh, I Calgary always kind of drew my interest. Yeah. I'd never traveled out west in Canada before, and loved loved That's the cool. opportunity. Yeah. And I really wanted to work in the NHL. That was a that was okay. I really wanted to take my education and put it to good use. And so, being kind of a, a dumb young person, yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm just going to pack my truck and go west and get a job with the Flames. They have an NHL team. Yeah, <laughs> why, why not give it a shot? It's not like the entire city of Calgary is trying to <laughs> try to get there. I might as well do it. Yeah. I was like, all right, go do it then. And now, so, did you have someone to stay with there? Like, do you have anything set up or no? No, wow. no nothing set up. She doesn't know this at this point. Maybe if she hears this podcast, but I lived in a hotel for 10 days and that actually took a hit on the bank account. No, I, think no. it's, I think it's still sitting on my credit you're, card you're, somewhere. You were a big pimp in the you went out there. Yeah, like, exactly. Back Come to back my to place. My, yeah. <laughs> so, I, uh, so, yeah, so I just went out there, ended up uh, finding a place a couple weeks in, lived in a you know basement and I just started networking with people out there uh, LinkedIn, just firing everybody. I yeah. think at the flames organization, a message saying, just meet with me. I want to see how you got to where you are. Yeah. And one guy, Scott Matheson, um, he took a shot on me, met for breakfast one day and it still took a few months after that. Uh, and you know, an entry level job came up no way. and I, and I jumped all over it. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't high paying. It wasn't glamorous. It was just here, get, get you in. And then we'll see, we'll see what you can yeah. do. So, and in that, in that sense, I was thrilled. I didn't yeah, care. That's amazing. So, but I mean, again, going back to like the type of guy you were probably type of athlete where, uh, you know, not a lot of people would even send out messages or emails or like pound on doors like that. Just randomly. You know just what I mean? Shit, man. Yeah. Dude, right. That was before, oh, that was, that was yeah. before I even that was saw, before this. You saw the video, man. You've been <laughs> just trying shit forever. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe you it invented it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if I did, I'd have a company yeah. with 900 employees <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, no, but I mean, that takes, that takes some balls, right. To be able to just throw it out there and say, meet me for, meet me for breakfast. And, kind of see what happens, you know, which I, which I think is, is obviously cool. And obviously they saw something in you. So you started entry level and then what happened from there? Did you end up getting an opportunity to kind of move up a little bit or? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, that organization is awesome. I still have really good friends who work there. Um, but yeah, the people, it was a young group of employees who kind of came in at the same time that I did. And we just kind of grew together. And, and after, you know, a year and a half, I ended up working with uh, the Hitman more on the business ops side under their their GM Mike Moore who's who is a great kind of mentor and learned a lot from him. He's a phenomenal person. Uh and just kind of grew grew from there. So but uh yeah, worked on the charity side with the Flames Foundation, worked kind of worked everywhere. I got a lot of cool. you know, a lot of other people's crap. Yeah. <laughs> but but instead of saying, well this is crap, I actually got to learn a lot from it. Like uh, I I learned a lot more than just the positions that I had. Right. Uh which was which was fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So then you were there for like roughly three years, I guess, working? Yeah, like, like three and a half, just shy. I think just shy of four years. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what, uh, as far as being behind the scenes with an NHL team, what was that like? Like, do you guys have any interaction with the players, with the team, with the game? Like, are you guys at the games most of the time? Are you guys part of that? Yeah, I worked when I, when I was on the event team, I worked every game night, um, which was fun. I, you know, being yeah. an athlete who wanted to get to the, the most elite level, it was fun being around. Uh, you know, we never really interacted with the athletes, yeah. but fun seeing what an elite athlete looked like. Uh, so, you know, I, one of my jobs, I was in the tunnel before, before every cool. game and took yeah. out the little kids for the, you know, their pregame skate and then yeah. came back in. I remember one time when uh, Yuri Hoodler was still yeah. there, he came out and some of the guys get into their routine. They give you, you know, knuckles or something. And he bagged me going out on the ice, <laughs> like intentionally just came up and just smacked me. Oh yeah. It was, Come it was, you know, oh yeah. It was hilarious. <laughs> Um, and you got to act all professional. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're like, in like a suit and tie, and you're yeah. like, this yeah. like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, But no, it was it was awesome seeing those guys. Never, you know, other than the the Flames charity events where you get to see yeah. them outside of the rink. Um, I I never interacted with them. They wouldn't know my name. But yeah. it was uh, it was fun seeing how an NHL team works on the on For the sure, back end. Yeah. Yeah, because you see it on you see it on like Hockey Night in Canada or mm. on the Tuesday night game or whatever it is, right? And then 
now you kind of see the nuts and bolts behind the scenes and yeah. some of the stuff I'm sure you're like, wow, this is actually how they run. Like, this is crazy. And other yeah. stuff like this is, cause I know whenever you peel the layers back on, especially sport teams, a lot of stuff is smoke and mirrors. Like it's just a train wreck behind and everything looks <laughs> that really looks nice great. up front. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then some, some stuff's obviously like, wow, this is pretty polished. This looks pretty slick. So being able to get up behind the scenes on something like that is definitely yeah, kind of a cool experience. Oh yeah. There, you learn a lot on the run. Like a yeah. lot of things go wrong on live TV. Yeah. A lot of things, but, but people mo- don't notice. People like, don't yeah. know. And that's you what you got to get yeah. over. Yeah. 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 No, it's cool. Um, so then, so, I mean, I, I kind of, I heard the story, but I want to hear from you. So you're playing, you're basically part of the kind of the staff softball team, right? And yeah. You guys are playing and just regular game on a yeah on a, Thursday. I think, I think it was a Saturday morning, and I, I'm lucky it was in the morning because you, it's beer league. Usually, you're you're having a yeah a couple pops and you're enjoying yourself. But yeah, I think we were in a tournament or something. We played early in the morning, and so uh, like, like if she had caught you in the afternoon, you'd been crushed for sure. I wouldn't have been the athlete that I was in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> there would have been no home run in the morning <laughs> in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, luckily again, dumb luck. Did I, you know the other team at all or just random? No, it's just, just random, some, random yeah. guys. Um, it's the media league in Calgary. Yeah. So it's like the events okay. kind of the, you know, the radio shows, all yeah. that kind of stuff. And, and I didn't know anybody. Um, but it just so happened that the, one of the individuals on the other team was uh, a recruiter for bobsled. And so the way bobsled works, you come, you come from every different sport. Yeah. So they recruit, no one grows up wanting to be a bobsledder. So they right. recruit a lot from a lot of really different areas. And so she saw me run the bases, I think. And, and I think I had a home run or something that game. And she came up and asked me if I wanted to go to an ID camp. And so just a, literally, a, you know, dozens of yeah. kids out there and seeing if you can broad jump, it's like a combine, yeah. right? Um, and things went from there. So yeah, I would like to thank Beer League Slow Pitch for, <laughs> for my yeah, Olympic seriously. career. <laughs> so, okay, but that does not apply to men's league hockey, okay? Because there's going to be more men's league yeah. guys, guys slashing yeah. guys trying to fight. Yeah, you can't have that. Drop the gloves. Yeah, you can't have that in men's league. So let's pull that enough. back to just slow pitch. If you want to make the NHL, yeah. go to TPH. If you're in men's league and you're like 25 yeah, years exactly. old. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Um, that's so how. At the ID camp, how'd you do that? Did you end up like, you end up doing well? Did you crush all the other guys? I did. Yeah, I did well. Um, but I was like, I was out of shape. Yeah. I was a little, like, I remember going back uh, and Laura was out in Calgary at this time. She'd moved out with me. Laura's your way, way, my, way, my, way my, better my, half. Yeah, way better half. Much better. Yeah, okay. She's the one who's encouraged me to do everything in my cool. life. And and in this one, I I mean, shirt off. I was, I was not a athlete anymore. <laughs> right. And so I was like, I the bobsled you're like looking in the mirror yeah, like i was like oh god really? she's like me? yeah she's <laughs> like just just go out and give it a shot uh so I, luckily speed speed that i had i trained for for you know a decade at that yeah. point or 15 years <laughs> it hadn't really gone away under all the fat so <laughs> so i was uh i was able to hit the standards and, yeah. and do well and i was still kind of explosive and i was kind of the the weekend warrior at the gym at the time so i wasn't completely yeah. out of uh out of shape yeah, I ended up doing well, and so I got invited to just kind of see what practice was like at uh, at the national level. And the the year after the Olympics is is a bit of a down year. A lot of people, a lot of turnover, a lot of people retire. Right. So it, it again, I just came in at the right time where they they had a spot open, and and I came home one day and told Laura, I think I'm going to quit my job and start bobsledding no for a career. Way. Yeah, because it uh, it just it went well, and I yeah. again, it's pretty cool. I yeah. just wanted to you know, try shit. I wanted, <laughs> yeah. I, wanted, yeah. I wanted, I wanted to try something new. I loved my career at the flames. I, For sure. I, I would have loved to stay there, but, but this is kind of almost like a, it's not like oh, I'll do it the next Olympics. You got to kind yeah. of jump on it or yeah. not. Right? It was now or never. And, yeah. and when I had the opportunity to get back and in, in that Olympic dream started burning again and, and the idea of being an athlete and being around athletes for the previous, you know, three and a half, four years, it's like, I, I want that. I want yeah. to give it a shot. And not a lot of people get second chances. And again, I, I don't know what I did to deserve a second chance, but I got it. Well, you played beer league slow pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crushing. Always crush, did. Hey, check this guy out. Okay, he crushed like 12 beers. <laughs> yeah. And then they're like, wow, he can run too. I want him. This guy's <laughs> a bobsledder. He can drink and perform. Exactly. Holy. Yeah. And we're going to get into that too, because I want to get some inside scoops on the Olympic, uh, the Olympic dream. Um, but uh, so when did you know, like, so like, I guess, when did you know that, man, I, I'm actually on the team? Like, was there kind of an official, because I'm sure there's a couple other guys that got passed through the ID camp and they're yep. all trying out for this one of four spots, right? Yeah. Three spots, I guess. Um, was there a moment where they're like, hey man, like we want you on? Because I'm assuming that, is it the captain that kind of 
want to kind of picks his runners or is it the coach that picks the so there's uh there's a head coach it's just like any other sports yeah. organization there's you know the high performance director head coach all that kind of stuff uh but the pilots yeah. are generally the captains of of their specific yeah. team so i remember going out and you have to hit standards do all that kind of all that kind of fun stuff in the ice house in calgary and i was like a hundredth of a second off the standard uh, the like the push test okay. standard and so I like I would stem up, I'd get fired up every single practice. I was that guy going in and just like, I need to hit this standard or else I wasn't able to be on the team. Yeah. So I think it was like two weeks before we left to go to Europe. I have I wasn't on the team yet. I was kind of that guy on the side. And then I finally hit standard. And Chris Spring, uh, who people probably know if you watch the Olympics, he's he's been to a couple now. Um he gave you know, he gave me a shot and said, I'd love to have you on my team. Was there another guy already in that spot that had to uh, no. So they were, it was a bit of a funky year. Like they were trying to piece together the team because okay. no one, there was a lot of really good athletes, but no one had, none of the new guys had hit that standard oh, okay. yet. And they're pretty firm with that, with yeah. that kind of stuff. Uh, so I was lucky enough to, to hit it and, and he took a flyer on wow. me as a guy that he never really knew. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of grew from there. Cool. Yeah. And so who, who are the four of you then? And did you four stick through those three years after that? Or no, no, the, uh, so the, f the other guy actually from London, Ontario was on my team, Alex Kopach, who won okay. a, a gold medal at this year's Olympics in two man with, uh, with Justin Krebs. No way. He, he far exceeded my athletic talent in bobsled. He's a, he's a monster. He was like six, five, like yeah. two fifty. He was a, he was a big boy. Um, but the, the team that I went to the Olympics with, uh, was myself, Cam Stones, who I slid with for a good portion of my career. Uh, he's from Whitby. The pilot, Nick Polinato, was a was a rookie pilot at the time okay. uh, from Hamilton. And Ben Cokewell, who was a, a really good football player at USASC, who went to Sochi as well, uh, wow. and Pyeongchang. So we've and we've all remained good friends. Cool. And, and yeah, it was a it was a really good dynamic. I slid with all of them quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, so it was really nice to go to the line with some guys that you trust. Yeah. Cause the training, I'm sure that the, the, probably the two years leading up is pretty intense, right? Oh yeah. And when did they kind of tell you, okay, you're going to have to leave your job. Like, was there, a, or did they ever tell you that? I mean, obviously you knew you probably are going to have to do that, but was there a point where you're like, you got to kind of choose here? I, uh, when I started doing crappy at my job and crappy at training, cause okay. I was trying to do both. Yeah. Uh, I realized that I, I needed to pick one or the one or the other. Uh, and I knew at that point and the flames were super supportive. Like, I think they let me train and kind of do half days for three months wow. to try to figure it out. Yeah. So they, they loved it. They yeah. loved the idea of having an athlete, uh, work for them and try. Uh, but eventually I, it got too much and I was doing poorly at both. Yeah. And so I cut the flames, uh, and went right into bobsled. Yeah. Now, when you cut the flames, you're obviously getting paid. You've got a, you know, girlfriend, you know, you got other things going on. Yeah. Um, when you leave that job and then jump into full-time bobsled, is there, do you get paid? Is there a compensation there? Is there a full-time salary there for you? Like, Yeah. So you get uh, a lot of the Olympic sports, you get carding, mm -hmm. it's called. Um, and so you, but you need to make the national teams and get nominated. So when you, when you make a team, it's like, you're, you're not, you're, yeah, nominated. you're not getting paid at all. Okay. You need to get nominated for carding as a, as a targeted athlete towards yeah. the future. Uh, and then you do get paid uh, if you get that. So the first couple of years are rough because you have to get a development card and then you right. get a senior card. It's, it's just like any other company. So your company. first two years while you were still, or your first year, let's say, or first, I guess, three, four months, you were still yeah. working for the Flames. And yeah. then when you quit, were you already nationally carded or no? No, not oh, at that no. point. So you just, you just sucked it up. Yeah, it was uh, it was the bank of mom coming through nice. quite a bit. Mom Z, <laughs> shout out to mom, mom Z. Yeah, mom and grandma <laughs> helped me out quite yeah. a bit uh, for for that first couple months. Yeah. But again, they, it's just being surrounded by people who kind of have faith yeah, in you. Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, but then, yeah, and then, you know, once you make the team and you show some sort of promise, then they'll start carding you yeah. and you start seeing a little bit more. But three out of the four years are rough. The Olympic year is fun because everybody hops on board. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, a large portion of the the sporting world cares about the Olympics, the year of the Olympics. 100%, yeah. So it's making it through those three years. And a lot yeah. of people grind and they work, you know, a lot of part-time job yeah. athletes. And then they're training at night. Like it's, it's crazy, it's, man. It's a, real, it's a real world grind yeah. trying, to be, trying to be that. 
And what would like just to give a ballpark? You don't have to give exact numbers on yeah. what you made. I mean, if you have your T four, you can throw it over. <laughs> uh, no, but like what would it's that? bursary, so we don't get a T four. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, no tax. Grade. Exactly. Uh, but like, what, like what would an what would a what would a high end Olympic athlete to a low end, or is it all the same? Like, what, like what would an Olympic athlete made in that make in that Olympic year? So it's always a, it's always kind of the million dollar question that people I know I've always asked because I've never really known right, but uh, like yeah, what is there like? What we yeah, what is that number? Carding carding is carding regardless okay. so of what. So it's not a sport you play. No, okay. carding is carding. The uh, you know the the upper level carding is enough to like pay a mortgage. Yeah, but it's not enough to. So you're talking like 30, 40 grand a year, maybe 20, 20, 30? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I've never actually put the numbers together. Yeah, yeah, I just know roughly, that you I've, get a I've been every able to. Yeah. And, yeah, you get paid. You well, you get paid every two months. So you got to learn how to budget. Jeez. Yeah. So you get so you get two See, months worth of pay, but every every two months. Yeah. To, uh, and then sponsors come on and, uh, okay. and there's great, you know, great, um, organization can fund, mm -hmm. uh, who helps athletes. They give, you know, they give targeted athletes bursaries. Um, Alberta podium fund has helped me a lot when I lived out there and they give you bursaries as well. So yeah. there's a lot of, you know, the, what the government gives you for, with carding, that's enough to at least allow you to try to live. Yeah. And then it's on you to go out and get the rest of your money. Oh, okay. So that's where they're. There can be some pretty big gaps, and that, that's that, that's Huge. where the gaps are, right? Like yeah. you get some people that are, you know, some company really likes them, or a person. It could be an individual, even maybe, and sponsor them, and then others. It's yeah. Yeah. just grinding okay. with the yeah. yeah so you don't get your like your is. your higher end, not your higher, end, but let's say you're bigger, <clears throat> like your figure skating, or like your your bigger. The more sponsors they have, the more money they could potentially well, make. Like, right? Absolutely, yeah. I would imagine it's probably. Now, like things like Instagram could probably have a big difference. Like if you got a hundred thousand followers as an Olympic athlete or whatever, like is that does that leverage yeah. a little bit? Like could you could yeah, any that company probably, want, right? Yeah, like, yeah. anybody a company toss would want your to be that, whatever yeah. on there and like that probably influences it, I would think. I don't know, but yeah, it but, does like, it does. But a lot of companies like giving like in kind sponsorships too. So so a lot of people uh, in Calgary had or, or surrounding had like fit kitchen. So instead of having to pay for food, they'd give you, oh, okay. you know, like healthy meals, yeah. a lot of protein sponsorships, yeah. a lot of things like that. Yeah. So um, they give you their product kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, and you help them promote it. Like exactly. Yeah, which, yeah. which, which is huge. Like that. If you're not paying for all your food. That's a, yeah, it's that's a, nice. it's a big, it's a big thing, but there's a huge disparity. I mean, but again, they've worked the people, the best athletes in the world yeah. have worked to be the best athletes in the world. So they deserve a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, so they'll, you know, they'll make a healthy living, yeah. uh, in prize money too, on, you know, if you do well on tour or on whatever your respective tour is, you get prize money right. and, and all that fun stuff. And if yeah. you met all the games, Canada will give you some cash. So if you're good, you can yeah. definitely make a career out of it. But, uh, again, that's a small percentage. A lot of people are just doing it for the, for the love of yeah. what the Olympics represent. Yeah. Um, and so going back to your team, like the, the, that Olympic year, you guys were training together going to, you know, you're, you're competing together. Yeah. Um, and how are the parties together? Like when you guys are on the road and stuff, was it like after you guys are done competition, would you guys go out and kind of let loose a little bit? Yeah, it's a, it it's a small community of, of like bobsled, not a lot of people bobsled. Yeah. Um, it's huge in Europe, not so much in, in Canada and America. Uh, but yeah, we would go, you know, we'd have beers together. We'd do all that fun stuff. Um, you know, the last couple of years were a little different because everybody's trying to focus and, yeah. and, and put their energy in a positive way. Uh, but the summers are are a lot better. The off seasons, yeah. the off seasons are fun. Um, like the you know Nick and Cam came to my wedding a couple weeks ago, and we we you know we helped rip it up a little bit. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a great group of guys. Yeah. Like you, the fun thing is you're all in the same situation, so yeah. you all push each other. You all know the hardships. You all know the highs and lows. So when you get out and you're able to let loose a little bit, yeah, bobsledders know how to party. Yeah, I know. I've heard yeah. that. And that's why I went to Oscar. <laughs> um, now, would, would you guys, would you guys party with other countries as well? Like, would you guys, if you guys run at a, you know, on a meet somewhere or at a, at a competition yeah. somewhere, would you end up going out with some of the other? Yeah. And is it similar stories with them, to, like Canada to other countries? Yeah. You, I mean, again, you know, countries like Germany, the, those guys, those guys make, some cash. Yeah. Uh, they also have like government run programs where a lot of them are in the military or, or police or something. Right. And then they're considered mm. sport employees. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we'd go out. We, we liked most of the countries that we competed against the Americans. We, we used to hang around the Americans a lot. They yeah. were, they were really good guys and they spoke English. So yeah, it was right. a lot easier. Uh, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of the guys were good. We, we, you know, we would go and have some fun together. Oh, that's cool. And some then, of those, go some ahead. of those other countries, do they start? Like I know in Canada, a lot of times it's say done track or football or something like that. 
you know, there's that ID process and everything. Is there any other countries where they actually start doing bobsled at a younger age that you know of? Uh, some of the European countries, a lot of the kids will start it in luge. Oh, so you learn, way. so you learn the tracks when you're super young. Like yeah. these kids are, are really young. So like That's elementary. Crazy. Oh yeah. Age? Yeah. Wow. So they, they learn the track and they become familiar with not only luge, but other sports. And then as they grow up, uh, they become really good drivers because they know all the tracks yeah. around the world already. So it's uh yeah, it's a different, it's a bit of a different world over there. They don't take quite the, the approach that like Canada and America does <clears throat> that grow up doing different sports. Yeah. Uh, in Europe, it's a it's an event. Like it's they they're very prideful about yeah. doing well in in that sport. So that's cool. That's yeah. interesting. Man, luge. Man. I just send like a, your eight nine year old kid down the track and luge. Like I'm so it's ignorant like to it though. Like I have no idea. Yeah. Like no, there's no way. There's no way. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess if you didn't like your kid, just, yeah, send it down. just, just I got two more. We're fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now, like if we go into that yeah. Olympic year, what was that Olympic year like as far as? Did you guys feel a lot of pressure just going to the Olympics and now you're part of that Olympic team and, you know, kind of, I guess the build up to the, to the Olympics, you know, you got to qualify, right? So you're put, like you're, there's a lot of stress in that moment, I guess, getting up to that qualifying and then finally getting qualified when you actually, well, go through that process of, of getting qualified. Was it an easy process? Was it a bag or was it? No, it was, it was stressful. So our, you know, our, our Olympic committee, because our season runs so long, uh, we actually didn't know if we made the Olympics until three weeks before the Olympics. No way. Yeah. So the, luckily Canada had one of their more successful years or the most successful year in, in sliding history. So we had two, two sleds will qualify regardless. And so we had three, but the third sled needs to be, it might sound confusing, but needs to be top three in the world among the other countries, okay. third sleds. And so we, we came down to essentially the last competition to, to, be in that spot. So we were, yeah, we were, we didn't know that we were going to be in the Olympics until like three weeks oh, before, but then even then you have alternates and, and yeah. on your team. So you don't know if you're going to get chosen to the Olympic team or be an alternate. So yeah, it was pretty stressful. Like it's, it was, yeah. you, you were on for you know, eight point, months. You've been training for four years. Like, Oh yeah. It would have been a waste. Yeah. I would have had some, some tough conversations. No, no, <laughs> a little bit of self-reflection. Yeah, exactly. Here, right? <laughs> exactly. The, I remember there was one, one point where, uh, where it wasn't my, I don't know if my Olympic spot was on the line, but generally they have push-offs to see who, who does better on certain teams. And, uh, you really kind of dig deep in yourself. Oh, yeah. And I, that was the first time that I, I kind of brought something out in me. It was the, like the, the fear of disappointment was, made me an insane athlete at that point. Like yeah. I, I went through everybody in my life, you know, for the hour before I was like, I can't tell, Just thinking, like, I can't tell my mom. I can't tell Laura. I can't tell my grandma. I can't tell, you know, Keith, like whatever I need to do, I need to find it right now or I'm yeah. going to get sent home. Yeah. And so it was, it was funny going to that like dark place. Cause I'm a very relaxed person. But at that point it was in Switzerland. At that point I was a demon. Like I was in a dark place. I was yeah. like, there's no one get in this. my way because you will get yeah. your face shredded. <laughs> and how, yeah, well, but it, but man, when there's that kind of pressure, you put that much time in on something, it's like, yeah, all or nothing almost on those. Yeah, like, you know. So how how did you end up doing on that? Push well, up? oh yeah, yeah. I, I it was probably the, one of the best pushes in my life. But yeah. it goes back to what we talked about earlier: is it there's there's a couple types of athletes, and you know, you either rise to that occasion, yeah. or or you shy away from it. Yeah, and. It, in my opinion, there wasn't any other way than to rise to the occasion. So like I said, that was, that was a cool point in my athletic career because I had never got into that mindset before. And, uh, and it was, you know, it was scary. You wouldn't be able to carry that mindset <laughs> yeah. like, like for six months you, a right? year. Yeah. Like you'd be drained. Like you'd oh, be too much. I was gassed. Yeah. But yeah, like, like <laughs> when you get to the bottom and you hear what you push and you're like, you know, you're swearing um, everything. Yeah. You're like, this is like, yeah. This is it. Like I, awesome. I did it. Yeah. Um, but then you got to flip on the other side cause you're pushing against a teammate who, right. who you might care about or, you know, in, and you're on this high and then they might be on this low because all of a sudden they're now their life. Now they're on the flip side. Now they've trained yeah. for four years. And so is that kind of what happened? Then you guys got in, they got bounced. Yeah. Yeah. That's the tough, one, yeah. the one guy got, got bounced in it. And, and so it was, you know, you care about their feelings, but in the same breath, you're it's like off. Yeah. This is kind of, yeah. it, it's the sport. It's it, that sport. Bobsled is cutthroat. You get cut 
two weeks before the games. Yeah. And so, but I mean, I guess the more important question is, did he get a participation badge for doing it? <laughs> like, <laughs> but, but, no, but, 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 but my point is though, like, like, and I don't, I don't mean to make, make, like, uh, make fun of that, but my, my point is that's life. Yeah. Right. Like if you're not performing at your job and someone's better than you, they come in and scoop your job. Well, that's your mortgage, your family's meal. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And this is a, this is sport. It's a little bit different, but at the end of the day, if we don't teach our kids at young ages to win and lose and how to come back from losing and how to rebound from stuff like that. Yeah. Now that's a, tr that's a traumatic experience for the, unfortunately this young man who worked his ass off for a lot of years and, and all of a sudden that doesn't happen for him, but maybe, maybe he's not a, as athletic as you are. Maybe he didn't put as much time in, you know, better than anybody. You don't have to say it, but I'm sure if we all looked at it and looked at both bios, you can see, well, you know what, this is why that happened. Right. Yeah. Or maybe you just dug down that day and you just had a little bit more in. Yeah. It doesn't, who, who knows? He had an off day, he had a good day, but that's life. And I think, you know, at young ages, we need to teach our kids how to deal with that. And then when you go through stuff, you know, just like, and you brought a really nice point where you're at a high, but when that, when they're done or you guys meet up again in a minute or 10 minutes or five minutes, yeah. you got to bring your high down to a low or to a medium. Yeah. Like, Hey man, I'm so sorry. You know, and you got to check yourself. And right? he was, and that's the cool thing is that we, we had slid each other with each other for a while and he, he worked his tail off. But he, we had a very a mutual respect at that point yeah. for what had happened. He was a very gracious loser at that point, yeah, because um, he did give it his his all, for and, sure. it, and it was it was it was a fun moment as an athlete, at least for me, to to kind of see that respect come yeah. through. But it's like it's like you know when you your kids are playing soccer now and they don't keep score, yeah, it's hard. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't get it. No, I don't think it's a bad thing to learn. No, no I how agree. to be a gracious I loser agree. or winner. Yeah. I agree. It's funny. My, uh, so my little guy, my little guy's five, my little girl's four they're, or six, just turned six, but they're young, like super young. So young age is no problem. Go out and have fun. The soccer is terrible. It's really bad to watch. And they're just <laughs> learning how to kick a ball and play, which is fine. Now my son's six. So it's actually a little bit better. Not great, but a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And I missed the final weekend because we had something going on here. So they had their final weekend and my son comes up and he's like, now their team for whatever reason, just randomly had a couple of good players on it. And so did my daughter's team. So they actually like won a lot of their games, but no one kept score, but it was, you kind of knew what the score was just, yeah. or uh, who watching. won, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyways, my, my son's like, oh, everyone got a medal or something like that. And, uh, and he said something like, like, both like, teams, like yeah, yeah. And he's like that, like, should everyone have got a medal? Like kind of something along those lines. Like it wasn't, you know, and I'm like, no. So I said, no, everyone shouldn't have got a medal. The winner should have got a medal. So, you know, like I know you're, I know he's young and we were kind of joking about it, but I'm like, no, no that's true though. Like, like, not everybody should get a medal. If you lose, like you're not going to get a medal, you know? And he's like, oh, you know, and it, we, it was a fun, like fun yeah. conversation. We were joking around about it, but I want to teach my kids that no, like, you know, if my kid comes home with a participation badge, I'm going to take it and rip it off and throw in the garbage. I, was just gonna say, <laughs> I can see you coming in, just taking that metal and burning it. Yeah. Hey, this is not yours. You didn't yeah. earn this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't want to be too harsh on, on, on my kids or any kids, but I agree with what you, I 100% agree. I think our kids need to learn how to lose and how to be a gracious loser, a loser shake hands, a good game. You can mm. be mad, go home and cry. I've done it. I'm sure you've done it. You lose a bad game. You maybe you blew the game for your team. I've lost a ton of my oh, life. Same. More, and, than, more than I've won, I'll yeah. tell you. That. And I showed up again the next day at the rink or at the pitch or wherever we're doing and, and play again. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It, it's part of it, right? But, and I, I think a lot of that comes back to, and you said it even with your mom and your grandma, like having that support system around you where they'll, they'll pump you up, they're going to help you succeed, but at the same time, they're going to give it to you straight when you do fail or when things aren't right yeah. and, you know, kind of help ground you a little bit and level you off and, and learn how to, like, you got to think you got to learn how to lose or learn how to suck, you know, learn how to be bad at something. And we tell kids all the time, like, all we care about is put an effort in. Yeah. I'm not a good dad every day. I'm not a good husband. I'm not a good, good at my job every day, but I just try to put a bit of an effort in, yeah. you know, sometimes I'm terrible, but just put an effort in, you know? And I think a lot of times kids don't, and I, you know, I'm hard being hard on kids right now, but like a lot of times they just, <laughs> they like, man, they mail it in. They yeah. have no interest in being here, you know, and, and whether it's school or hockey or baseball, whatever that is, you know? Um, and that's okay. They're, they're young. They're allowed to do that, but you know, teaching them the right way to do it and teaching them to kind of rebound from that and, you know, cause I think these life lessons are stuff that I feel we're losing a little bit at times with our young, our, our young generation, you know, for sure. And I, I think it was fun speaking of that when, uh, you know, when Mitch invited me to start training some of the pro guys, uh, speed on the Wednesdays, it was fun to see them be a lesser than elite athlete when, you know, you ask guys to bound. And I yeah. remember when Mitch and I started that, they ended up being very, very good at it by the end, but it's fun seeing really good athletes have to try hard after they've tried hard at a certain sport all their life. But they were, they were gracious in the fact that 
they're like, yeah, I can't do this well. And they liked it and, and they, they want to learn it. Exactly. And so they took it upon themselves to be competitive with each other because no one wanted to suck the most. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so all of a sudden, yeah. all of a sudden, they're all pushing each other to do it really well. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was fun to see that. And I, and I think it takes a special person or a special group of guys to have that. Because you're right. People do mail it in. They're like, oh, this is useless. Why do I need yeah. to learn speed or bounding? I'm a hockey player. And really, the, the reason that they, I think they'll think that a lot of times is because they suck at it. If they were really good at it, they'd be like, this is great. You should, everyone should do it. Yeah. All these other guys suck at it. I'm real good at it. Like, but, <laughs> totally, yeah, you know, exactly. And then, but with these guys, like, you see them at the start line, and they're like, you can see them, like, moving their arms a little bit, like, thinking about it, like, trying to, like, okay, this next time, I think last time I did this, so, like, <laughs> I got to try to do this a little bit better. Like, they're, they're trying yeah. to process the whole thing, right? And the whole group's like that, whereas sometimes yeah. if you take out um, a different group, it, I mean – yeah, they just check out if they're not good at it the well, first time. Well, that's the thing. You have know, a couple guys that suck at them. Like, I'm like, oh, this is stupid. I don't need this. And they kind of check out of it, right? For yeah. sure. Um, so the Olympic Village, um, uh, what was that like? It was fun. You know, there there are a lot of questions that I've got asked uh, since, 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 dry, since right? coming like, back. No one... Yeah, it's it, – Every story that you hear, it's at least the, the true. Is, yeah, like is there condoms all over the place? There is, is it a sex fest, <laughs> so there, stuff like that. There, there is condoms all over the place, but it is not necessarily a sex fest. It's people taking those condoms. Yeah, it's not necessarily them using it, right? Uh, but it's taken, it, and so it adds to the stats. You know, the crazy stats come out about the Olympics, but it's not. It's it's supposed to be dry. Okay, um, it's, you, it's it's clearly not. It's supposed to be okay. dry. <laughs> um, but other than that, you know, it's it's funny because I I had this idea of what the village was going to be, and I was you know bright eyed or wide eyed. I was like, this is my first Olympics. I'm taking everything in. Um, and the Olympic Village was super cool to see because it was you know three thousand athletes or something um, who were finally at a moment in their athletic career where they needed to do everything they could yeah. to not screw it up. Because yeah. at that point, yeah. you've trained, you've done it's. Only you could screw it up at that point. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you know, when people were done competing, it was a different story. They'd go yeah. out, they'd have fun, they'd go to different events. Um, but for a large majority of the population in the village, it was just a bunch of really good athletes trying to beat a yeah. bunch of really good athletes. Yeah. That's uh, a good point, though, because everyone's dialed in, right? You're not like you're not going to get there the first night. Everyone's going to work partying. it off. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, we, and we were the last – we competed literally the last two days no of way. the Olympics. So we were there uh, a few days before the Games actually started. We did some moving back and forth between uh, the two villages. But, yeah, we, you know, we would – the first week we kind of went out and checked different events out in the different venues. But I'd say for a good two and a half weeks, if we weren't at the track, we were either getting physio or we were in our rooms. Really? Yeah. yeah. And so it, you know, a lot of people have this like crazy vision of what the, and maybe other countries are different, but luckily Canada that sends athletes who want to win. Yeah. Uh, and so they don't really, they don't put themselves in situations where they can't Which win. makes sense, yeah. So if I ever want to go back to the Olympics, I should look at the schedule and see what the, the first day events are. Exactly. <laughs> so I can get in, get out, and then I can just whip <laughs> exactly. it up. The exactly. <laughs> exactly. Whatever that first day is, yeah. fire yeah. that up. Train yeah. the next four or eight years for it. Yeah. You can have it's one day. and something then... like, you know, cross-country skiing. Like, I'm going to train with cross-country skiing. <laughs> um, no, that's cool. And now, I mean, something that you're going to be able to carry with you for the rest of your life, obviously, being an Olympic athlete. And 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 going through that whole obviously the training process is, was probably a lot cooler than, than 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 we're making it out just as far as how much hard work it was but yep. I'm sure it was a blast plus you training with some good guys and yep. girls. Now what was the actual event day like? So you're getting ready for your event. This is all coming up to this one or I guess three right? You get three mm-hmm. three trials out of it. But what what were those couple days like as far as just like going through that whole you know trying to nail it every time trying to be perfect every ride like what was that was it stressful was it crazy was it kind of a was it almost like a, a blink of an eye it wasn't it wasn't incredibly stressful at the start because we like i said we had such a good group of guys um and a really good group of veterans who who prepared us for what was coming and the coc helped prepare us for what was coming too so i think we went in uh as a rookie we went in thinking that we knew at least what was going on yeah so it wasn't so stressful um and we, you know, we focused on practice. I was, we didn't even think about the competition yet. We were nail every, every run we do in practice, just crush it. Uh, but then, yeah, when game day came and you're like, crap, I'm at the Olympics right now. Like this is, yeah. this is a big deal. 
Um, and I went out and, and, you know, my, my wife's family was there, uh, and my sister came and, and going out to the line, I remember the first time Canada had so many fans. It was, it was ridiculous. We couldn't even hear, uh, we make a call. So we're, we know we're all on the same page. We couldn't even hear the call. We had to tell them to like calm down for the rest of the runs, at least for that split second. But the only time, and I've, and I've told them since the only time I was nervous was when I was on the line and, you know, you, you see Bob Sayers, he, he, Put the visor down you kind of get focused look tough i looked over and i uh and i saw laura and, and my sister and and her family and and all that kind of stuff and i was like don't screw up yeah. <laughs> just no get, just get in the sled because yeah. i was a side guy at the time and you see a lot of really funny bales and yeah. people don't get in the sled and and uh <laughs> but I was like, don't screw up. And oh, I was that's so kind of the worst thing to say to yourself right before. Yeah, right. Which which is why Did going you coming the back there or what? replace the picture. Yeah. So I went over and I was like, oh man, like they're what they they spent a lot of money. They traveled to South Korea <laughs> and and just get in the sled. But then you have this little moment of clarity and you're like, no, replace that. This is just another competition. Uh and and I'm sure the other three guys on the team would say that same thing, whether yeah. they admit it or not, because all of our families were there. Uh, but yeah, that was the only nerve wracking part of it was the first run. Yeah. But after that first run, it was, it was, and we pushed well and, and Nick drove really well. Um, after the first run, it was like, wow, we're here now let's fire yeah. it up. It, oh, but it was cool. that initial, that was the first nervous part was just looking over and yeah. seeing who was there. Yeah. It's like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no. We're in South Korea right <laughs> yeah. now. And I'm, this yeah. is, this is the only, you know, you see the cameras on the side. You're like, this is. Yeah, it's this crazy. Is it. You eh? better perform. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you're on national television. You got tons of fans there. Like, yeah, the pressure, you know, it's it's pretty pretty cool for sure. Especially, I mean, playing sports your whole life, get, getting to that point. Yeah. It's that big. You're on the biggest stage in the world. It's, yeah. That's unbelievable. A lot of things start going through your head at that point. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of like life experiences. Yeah. It's, it's like a near death experience. You start fl- having flashbacks, we're, like stretching. You're like, man, when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, now we're here. No, it's a, it that's was crazy. phenomenal. Yeah. And then after the three runs, how, how did you guys end up overall? So we ended up, so you get, uh, three runs and then the top 20 get a fourth run. And then, and so it's two runs on each day. Yeah. Uh, we ended up 12th, which we were, we were happy with. We ended up, we started off 21st and, uh, in the way I like to describe it quickly, uh, it's like going on a sheet of fresh ice at the start of the period versus chopped up ice with five seconds left. And in a sport with hundreds, it's really hard to come back when you start so low. Um, So that we were a little bit behind the eight ball in that first run, uh, even though our pilot and our push was really good. And then the other three runs, we were right up there. So it was, uh, we were thrilled with how we did. Um, If we'd started up, you know, a little higher, it might've been a better placing. Yeah. But we did everything we could, and Nick Nick drove his mind out, especially as a rookie pilot. Like these yeah. things, I don't even know how people drive a bob sled. Like it is insane the reaction. Yeah. So I I think everybody performed like at the absolute top of their game. No one screwed up really. Yeah, which is which is obviously which is what you want. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and what are they? Uh, what's what's the plan for the next Olympics? Is would would Nick be back? And is most of the team going to go back? Are you planning on going back? Or? So the uh, world champs are in Whistler this year. Uh, which is fun. Not often does Canada get a world yeah. championship. So we're still kind of playing it by year. There's a couple of guys, people have located or centralized, sorry, back in Calgary. Uh, obviously I'm back here yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. So um, if that means anything, we're trying to discuss, it's, you know, it's tough for me right now to to focus on that because I'm trying to get ahead of life. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and focus on Laura a little bit. Yeah. You know, she's she's been with me for a decade we've known each other basically all our lives but she's been with me for a decade when i was away at university yeah and she came out to calgary and then i decided to go away again for bobsled (laughs) so i think it's time for me to settle down a little bit yeah uh with that being said i i would love to go out for half a season or keep training i don't know if that's fair to the guys out there which which weighs a little bit heavy on me um but I don't know, 35, 35 of the next Olympics. Like that's getting yeah. pretty old. Oh, I already got bad. grays. Yeah, you fine. You're fine. You got a full head of hair. You're good. You're but no, good. I'm, I'm still training hard. I'm still focused up. I, I haven't made a complete decision yeah. uh, on what I'm going to do, but I would like some time to kind of decompress and yeah. and take in what happened last year and the last For four sure. years. So what you're hoping is they're like, hey, we're in a pinch. We, we're short a guy. Yeah, can you just come <laughs> give us a hand? Like, honey, I've been I kind of got it. That would be nice. Yeah. 
Uh, you know, in a perfect world, that'd be great. But yeah. they, they've they created a really good culture there where they're trying to get rid of like the elitism right. of having really good athletes just come in and parachute when, you know, we yeah. called it parachuting in whenever yeah. they want and taking spots of guys who have been grinding there. And I've been a part of that. I've been mm-hmm. I've been kicked off world championship teams from guys who, who are better bobsledders than I am and have came in, you know, halfway through the season. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't really enjoy that feeling. And I don't know if, depending on the situation, I don't know if I'd want to do that to somebody else. Cause you know, like I said, I don't know if I'm going to be there for the next Olympics. So people have to go through these growing yeah. stages in their life. And in, especially in that sport to learn what the grind is. Yeah. And I don't want to take that opportunity away from them. Yeah. Oh, well, you're a good dude. But we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right um, one more quick question, probably just yeah. a couple more to wrap up here. But um, so I'll, get, I'll give you two. But if you had to go back and kind of talk to yourself in like high school or at any point in your, in your kind of career where maybe you're struggling a little bit or things weren't going or you changed from just a one sport athlete or one you know event athlete to the cat to the deck. Yeah. Um, what would you tell yourself? Is there anything that kind of comes to mind that, that you'd be like, hey, listen, you got to make sure you focus on this or make sure that you – don't worry about this stuff, really focus on that or, you know, enjoy the moment or whatever. Is there anything that kind of comes to your head where you're like, man, I wish I would have been a little bit more this way when I was doing what I was doing. I, I would definitely say, uh, I, I had hardships in, I think it was my second year in university in pole vault when I, I just got the yips, like I'd run down the runway and then just not even jump. Like something had gone into my head and it festered and and it, it made, I was a good pole vaulter and it made me trash. Yeah. Uh, and it, it was a huge struggle for me to get over that. Uh, I wish I knew the replace the picture sort of motto, uh, back then, because I, I put so much stress on myself at the time, be like, this is all you're doing in life. Like you are a pole vaulter at Cornell. This is, and so you just, you, you're dumping all this negativity on yourself and, you know, I'd start swearing, I'd start getting upset. And, and I've realized pretty quickly that in sport, it's not worth there's, there's so much pressure on you. It's not worth putting more pressure on yourself. And I wish, I wish I knew that at the time. And, you know, a lot of athletes go through the same thing. I'm not, uh, it's not a special individual thing. Um, but I've realized how important it is to come out of a situation and just be content with the effort that you've put in. And, and I think the reason that I, I, you know, I sucked that, uh, that for a good, better portion of that second year was because I would go home and I'd think about it and I didn't have any distractions or I didn't think I didn't let myself have any other distractions. Um, so I would, I would say to any athlete, make sure that you don't put more negative pressure on yourself. It's a negative world. Sports is a hard thing. You got enough people trying to bring you down and enough competitors trying to bring you down. If you help them with that, it's going to be a bad, bad, yeah kind of thing so oh, for sure that's right, um, yeah. so you know always put in the effort put in everything that you can and be happy at the end of the day that one you're doing athletics because there's a lot worse things in this world <laughs> yeah. that you could be doing and a lot worse situations that people are in the fact that you're even being negative on yourself or pressuring yourself because you maybe you didn't have a good game on the ice or bad shift there's people out there who, who are in much worse situations yeah. than that so i think you just enjoy it Take the good with the good and the bad with the bad, but you can't put more pressure on yourself than than other people are already putting on. No, I think it's a good point, man. And I think a lot of times as athletes, we do put way too much pressure. Looking back on, I'm sure when you competed at it or when I played, like I yeah, I was t- I took it way too serious at times, and you just beat you just beat the shit out of yourself more often than not, and it it it, it definitely downhill spirals. You know, you're not oh, gonna nothing good's gonna come out of that, right? Yeah, so it, it grows, yeah, and uh, you know you surround yourself with the people who don't let you do that, <clears throat> yeah. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of people trying to bring you down, and I think if you surround yourself with positive, a positive, a positive atmosphere, it, it does wonders. Yeah, you you have a distraction, you have friends, you you go to the rink, and there it is, and you still live life outside like you're an athlete, but you have people to to help bring you up yeah. when when you start doing bad things. No, oh, for sure. I mean, it's come up several times with others, and you've talked about it already, but just effort being the main. Focus. Like that's the one thing you can control. Yeah. And I mean, if you know that you're putting in your best effort, then. Well, even today, Mitch saw me out a pretty crappy lift down there. And, uh, and at the end, I was just like, you know what? Did just, what I, I did what I could, but I just didn't have it today. <laughs> hey, and, and that's, I showed up. I showed up today. <laughs> and that's, and I think people need to realize that you're not going to be 110% all the time. Yeah. You have a bad day. Everybody has a bad day. It's how you rebound from that bad day. Just 
you know what? It happened. I can't go back 20 minutes and all of a sudden get massive and lift this weight or yeah. put a better shift on. Just work on it and get better at it. Yeah, no, for sure. Last question. Uh, did you get an Olympic tattoo? Did you get a tattoo? Anywhere? I did. Yeah? I did, yeah. What did you get? Right there. Oh, there it is. Just I a little guy. It. Just a yeah. little guy. I, 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 I did the collection. I think I'm going to get one of those. <laughs> no, what is, you, I see, you should no you see a lot of like a lot of i don't know if it's a thing that you guys talk about or not but a lot of Olympic athletes get that the rings which i think is awesome yeah. like right but imagine just johnny schmo like, with he's, like rings. why did you go no i love the olympics <laughs> well, i just like it i like what it represents yeah exactly you know it's funny our coaches say that it's it's are you in it for the tracks track suits and photo shoots or are you in it to to actually you know yeah. compete and do well uh, and so, you know, this is, it's a fun little memento at it's the end great. of the day, especially if you like tattoos. Uh, but it takes a lot of hard, hard yeah. work to get there. But you've, you've earned that, right? And you've earned the right for people to ask you like, Hey man, did you go to the Olympics? Like, I think anybody that's gone to the Olympics, you're in such as elite class, really winter, summer Olympics doesn't matter. Um, that I, I think that you guys have earned the right. If you put the time and the work and the effort into it, yeah. you know, even as a kind of a bit of a rookie team to, to place, you know, to place in the top 20, yeah. top 30 of, uh, I, that, that's unbelievable. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's a fun story and it got me on this podcast. There so that's you go. Great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So five people are going to listen to this, but that's perfect. Right. <laughs> five more people know. That's it. Exactly. Exactly. Well, listen, buddy, thanks a lot for coming on, man. Thank this you. has been Appreciate awesome. It. And Mitch, thanks again for joining. We'll be getting you on a bunch more for sure. And, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I really appreciate it, man. It was, yeah, it was it's great. Been fun. Thanks, Thanks for having man. me. It's been it's been good. Oh, that's good. All right. See you, boys. See ya.